this for a patient who comes in complaining of intermittent paresthesia or numbness and tingling to the right upper extremity. What you want to do is you want to have the patient in a neutral position, sitting up straight, looking straight forward. All right, And you're going to ask them to tilt their head mm -hmm. to one side, typically the affected side. This, this is one of those tests where you can do the opposite side first if you prefer, but generally speaking, we're looking to establish the presence of radiculopathy. So ask the patient to lean their head to the right side and attempt to touch their ear to their neck. If they do this and it produces that same pain or numbness down that right upper extremity, that's considered a positive test. If, however, and you don't have to bend quite that much, if, however, they bend their head to the side and they don't experience that same pain, then you will perform the foraminal compression. What you'll do is you'll lock your fingers together and in a straight downward motion, you'll apply compression to the top of the head. Do not push the head further to the side. Do not tip the head further to the side. This is all about straight down onto the neck. And you do, <laughs> and you do have to push a little bit. Okay, you don't just come up here and just go, okay, does that hurt when I do that? I'm not even pressing on it. You cannot be afraid to push down a little bit on your patient. All right, if that produces the same pain, then that's a positive sign. Now, the patient who comes in with current radicular pain or pain radiating down the arm, what you're going to attempt to do is you're going to attempt to relieve that discomfort. And that's what the second test is for, and that's the distraction test. I need you to slide down to the end of the table for me, please. Just right there, that's it. What you're going to place, do is place either your right hand or your left hand behind the occiput, place the other hand underneath the chin, and I want to lift straight up most of the force coming from my back hand. I don't want to lift up on the chin. I want to lift up with the back and stabilize the chin with this hand. So I'm attempting to lift the head or lift the neck off and distract the vertebrae <laughs> off of the impinged nerve. So that's the distraction test. Again, that's for a patient who's having symptoms. If a patient's not having any symptoms at the moment, doing a distraction test is not going to do anything. So those are the two tests for the cervical spine uh, that we're predominantly going to worry about today. Uh, earlier today we talked about the Apley's scratch test. Now again, uh, I should probably ask the patient to disrobe appropriately, but since we're being videotaped, I'll maintain some degree of modesty. All right, the, the Apley's scratch test is a quick chest or range of motion and what you ask the patient to do is take your right hand and place it behind your head and reach down your back as far as you can. Bring your left hand up to try and touch the other hand. And I want to look at whether or not the patient can touch. We typically record this based on the superior arm. So if the patient's able to reach behind and touch, we'll say uh, right hand reaches to touch or something to that effect. Then we're going to ask the patient to switch positions and do the same thing. And let's say now that she was only able to reach down to T4 and up to T7. We would record those two locations. And that's why I told you in class today it's important to know the locations. So if she was able to reach up to the inferior border of her scapula, that would correspond to about T7. And if she was at the medial border, that would be about T4. So you would say, left arm reaches to T4, right arm to T7. Okay? Most people would figure out that the right arm isn't coming all the way down to T7 and the left arm all the way up to T4. You always start with the upper arm. Okay, so you can relax. So that's the athlete's scratch test. You're attempting to scratch your back, basically. The anterior instability or apprehension test. What you're going to do with the anterior instability or apprehension test is you're going to ab duck the arm to 90 degrees, you're going to flex the elbow to 90 degrees, and I'm going to apply anterior force on the proximal humerus. The biggest problem, stand up for me please, biggest problem that people have with this particular test over, is they press on the shoulder rather than the arm. If you're pressing on the shoulder, you're not going to do anything for this patient. So I have to apply anterior force to
to the proximal humerus. And what I'm attempting to do is I'm attempting to distract the bone forward while I'm externally rotating it. So that's what I'm doing. I'm pushing forward and externally rotating. And I'm, it, I'm doing this from behind so you guys can all see it. But in a normal patient, I would be doing it from a position where I could watch their face and observe for any signs of apprehension as well as feel for any laxity in the shoulder. Does that make sense? Yeah. Um, do you want them supine or say supine? You can do this in the standing position, and I was going to demonstrate that, but thank you, Dr. Finley. Uh, you can also do posterior distraction in this position as well, or you can have your patient lay down. If they can't stand up for whatever reason or you don't feel comfortable doing this with them sitting down, you can do the same thing here. The, the difficult process here is if you're going to do posterior, you're going to be pushing into the table and you're not going to do that. For anterior, you're going to want to externally rotate and lift up on the shoulder. Okay? The whole idea with the apprehension test, watch their face for that look of apprehension. They're not going to want you to do that. The person who has a nice stable shoulder, they're not going to change their expression all that much. Okay. Inferior instability test, one of my favorite tests. Go ahead and slide all the way to the end. And what I'm looking for here is I'm looking, I find the chromium process. <laughs> and I want to look just underneath or just inferior to the acromion as I apply downward traction to the arm. And rather than grasping it at the wrist, which is going to pull a lot of stress on the elbow, grasp at the elbow, and I want to apply negative pressure. And did you see that little bit of indentation that occurred when I did that? Okay, that's what you're looking for, is that, that indentation, that sulcus that forms in there. And you can't, she can't see it when, if she turns and looks at it, it won't do it. But you have to have the patient relaxed. Some people you'll see a nice divot form in their shoulder. So that's the inferior instability or sulcus sign. And you'll all get a chance to look at each other, and we'll find a couple of people in here, I'm sure, that will do this. All right, the next test is the speech test. And with the elbow fully extended, okay, and that's the, one of the key components. When you do these tests, make sure that you do them with the patient properly positioned. So with the patient's elbow fully extended, and with the patient's... Is that the next one? Okay, yeah, I'm surprised we got to the speech test already, that's all. And with the hand supinated. All right, you want to resist flexion and feel over the bicipital groove. So bend your arm for me, and I'm going to resist that, and I'm going to feel over the bicipital groove to see if there's any grating or if there's any inflammation over that bicipital tendon. This will also oftentimes produce pain in a patient who has bicipital tendonitis. All right, so that's Speed's test. Jurgensen's test, we're going to flex the elbow to 90 degrees, and with the forearm pronated, you're going to resist supination and pronation, or I'm sorry, supination and flexion. So I'm palpate here, I'm going to ask the patient, what I want you to do is I want you to turn your hand palm up and bend your arm up for me at the same time. So turn your hand palm up and bend, okay? And it's not a contest. Okay, you let, let, them, let them do this a little bit, but you want to resist the movement. So you're resisting supination as well as flexion. Again, feeling over the bicipital groove, feeling for a bicipital tendonitis. All right, so that's Jurgensen's. Question. Sir. The one above is speed. What's flat lesion? Supination. 